Hi, this is Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Welcome to the weekly top three, the top three things on our mind here at Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets for the week of August 26th, 2024. The weekly top three is a regular segment on The Michael Duke Show. The show broadcasts on both Facebook Live and YouTube Live, as well as via streaming audio from the show's website, weekdays from 6 to 8 a.m. I join Michael weekly in the first hour of Tuesday's show from 6.10 to 7 a.m. for a discussion between the two of us about our three issues. We post the podcast of our discussion following the show on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook, YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages, also on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets website, as well as the project's page on national blog site, medium.com. You can find past episodes of the weekly top three also at the same locations. Keep in mind that in addition to these podcasts, during the week, you can also follow and participate in the discussion with us of these and other issues affecting Alaska's fiscal and economic condition by following us on the Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets Facebook page and through our posts on Twitter. This week, our top three issues are these. First, we discuss our take on the results from the primary on the Alaska legislative races and what we see as the path forward. Second, we discuss the efforts by some to combine what we view as two entirely separate issues related to the permanent fund. Whether the permanent fund board should be reformed, which we strongly agree with, and whether the two account permanent fund structure should be merged into a single account, which we strongly disagree with. Third, we discuss how a recent letter to the editor from Keep Alaska Competitive Co-Chairs, Joe Shearhorn and Jim Jansen dodges a critical fact about oil taxes. And finally, we include a brief discussion Michael and I had during the break about the proposal by some to return state employees to a defined benefit pension plan. And now let's join Michael. Brad, let's uh, let's uh, let's dive into this, shall we? Let's get started. Let's uh, talk a little bit about uh, well, the primaries. Uh, I mean, not a huge amount of surprise there. A couple things that were interesting, and then of course the news post primary uh, has also been very interesting. But uh, take it away, my friend. Yeah, the news post primary may be as 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 interesting as the as the primary uh, itself, the people who are dropping out. Last night, Nick Moe, um, who was the, the only candidate opposing Carolyn Hall uh, in House District in West Anchorage, uh, dropped out, leaving Carolyn Hall as the only candidate in that, in that race, uh, which is not good for those who are concerned about the PFD and, and, and fiscal policy, but, uh, but it, it's a development. I've, I've looked at the primary results from a, from a couple of perspectives. One, I think they've helped clarify the positions of the candidates uh, as they've had to write in response to the Alaska Beacon uh, uh, survey request and as they've spoken on the issue and, and posted, uh, uh, had their websites up and other things. And I think that's helped clarify to some degree uh, uh, my reaction or my thoughts about the candidates. And the other, I think, I think the primary ha- has helped clarify uh, the races where support uh, or contributions, maybe they're the same thing, um, would be helpful. So using those criteria or using that background, I've, I've used, I've applied three criteria to sort of analyze the results uh, in the races. And that's and looked at the candidates from the standpoint of the position on fiscal issues, whether the candidate who I who who from my perspective has the strongest position on fiscal is, issues is winnable in a race, um, and 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 where support or cash uh, may make a difference, and I've and I've tried to identify candidates where I think where I think that uh, those criteria sort of sort of apply, and 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 candidates sort of rise to the top. I've identified six or five candidates that just absolutely rise to the top on those criteria. Um, certainly Ben Carpenter is at the top of the list, uh, in the, uh, in the Kenai, uh, Senate district, Kenai or Senate district D where he faces off against incumbent Jesse Bjorkman. That's a close race. Um, uh, Bjorkman was slightly ahead in the primary, but Ben was, 
was close behind him, uh, and I think it's going to stay a close race through uh, through the remainder of the cycle. Ben certainly is strong on fiscal issues that that I care about. I think he's both both a good has a good focus on on keeping the budget under control, uh, but also dealing with the PFD issue and dealing with uh, with a uh, uh, an equitable uh, revenue uh, approach to, to to dealing with the deficits that the budgets continually reveal. Um, and I think I think Ben certainly is 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 a candidate that that I'm going to spend a lot more time on talking about and a lot more time on focusing with uh, with contributions. I made another contribution the the day after the primary, uh, given given his strong showing. Uh, another one that falls in that category is going to be a surprise to to some. Frankly, it was a surprise even to me uh, as I as I sort of sorted through candidate positions and sorted through the results of the primary. Um, uh, uh, candidate, uh, 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 Moran in, uh, house district one, Agnes Moran in house district one, uh, has a very strong position on the PFD and a very strong position on the budget. Here's, here's what she told the, uh, the beacon, uh, if I can dig it up real quick, here's what she told, uh, the beacon with respect to the PFD quote, I strongly support a 50-50 PFD. The research is clear. A cut in the PFD is a tax, the most regressive tax we have at our disposal. PFD cuts have the largest adverse impact on Alaska's economy and push tens of thousands of Alaskans into poverty. These cuts ensure that non-residents, the top 1%, the top 5% do not pay their fair share for government services. I understand that a 50-50 PFD will require a fundamental reevaluation of the state's budget. We need to consider revenue options that do not disproportionately harm Middle, middle and lower income Alaska families ensure that non-residents pay their fair share for government services and tackle the state's spending problem. I'm not sure I could have written anything. I'm not sure I'm, I would have written anything any different in response to that. Right. So I, th I think Agnes is a is certainly to me on the House side is a very strong candidate. That's going to be a very House District One's a very um, it, it, the the three candidates finish very close to each other. Uh, Jer Jeremy Bynum uh, was out in front of the Republican candidate, but Agnes was right in there with uh, with the Democrat candidate. So um, that race, I'm going to pay a lot of attention to. That race was interesting because she had some good responses to several ones, but then I noticed that she also uh, it was kind of a, a it was a it was a median walk. She walked some different things, like on the ranked choice voting, she supported ranked choice voting and a couple other things, but. Again, when you have two nonpartisan or non-affiliated candidates and a Republican, I guess it's up to them to kind of duke it out between the two of them before they fight it up with a Republican, I guess. Yeah. Interestingly enough, Agnes ran as a Republican uh, in that district uh, in 2012 and 2014. Um, she ran against Dan Ortiz. When Dan, or Dan Ortiz first uh, got elected, she, was the, uh, she ran in the Republican primary. Um, and she ran uh, in the Republican primary also in 2012. So she has a Republican background. Um, that district is a little wonky. I mean, Ortiz was elected as an I oh, yeah. down there, down, down there. So I don't, I don't begrudge her uh, running uh, outside of the or running as an in nonpartisan. Um, and I am, and 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 and, and nobody's going to be a perfect candidate on all the issues. Sure, from my. Sure. From my from my standpoint, the fiscal issues are the top is the top issue because if we yeah, don't no, I, just, I just think it's interesting that again, especially because you have to focus it the way the district is, and as you said, Ortiz was an independent, although he caucused with the Democrats, but that seemed to that seems to garner more attention in that district than anything else. Um, they may not be on the partisan bandwagon one way or the other. Yeah, so I so I think I I'm I'm. Uh, excited uh, for that campaign. I'm excited for her results. She finished third, but it was a very close third. Uh, and and I think ranked choice voting is going to play a big a big role in how that district ultimately plays out. So um, can, that's that's a candidate that I'm going to support there. House District Six, Sarah Vance um, has some opposition. Um, she got it. She finished first in the primary, but it's not a walk in the park. By any stretch of the imagination, that's going to come down to being a very uh, uh, well fought out race as well. And I think supporting Sarah in that district is going to be uh, is going to be important. House District Eight. This is Ben Carpenter's old House District. Uh, there are two candidates there: John Hillier um, 
uh, and uh, and Bill Elam. Uh, Bill Elam's on the Kenai Peninsula Borough. Uh, John doesn't have a political background, but John comes across as sort of as sort of the Ben successor, Ben Carpenter successor in that district. Right. Uh, certainly has good positions on the PFD. Talks about. Uh, in in his in his fiscal plan talks about the fiscal policy working group and I think that's going to be a race I focus on also. Mia Mia Costello in House District 15. Um, Mia is, doesn't have the world's best responses on the, on the PFD and on the budget um, in um, in in her responses to the Beacon, but her voting record in the Senate. Uh, remember she was in the Senate before she was defeated by Matt Clayman. Her voting record in the Senate was a very strong PFD, uh, position. And I think, uh, uh, speaks well for, for her. That's going to be a tough race. Uh, her opponent, Danny Wells, uh, is, is extremely well funded. Uh, but Mia finished first in that primary and, uh, is a, is a strong, has demonstrated a strong track record in that, in that district. So I, I think that's going to be a good race to watch and follow. Frank Tomaszewski, um, up in uh, up in Fairbanks, House District Thirty Four, that, that primary may have been a little tighter than I think people anticipated, uh, than right. I anticipated, and uh, and Frank's got some opposition in from Joy Beth Cottle, who uh, has an R behind her name. Um, Frank, but, but again, going back to history, is not an R. Let me just yeah. let me just point that out. Yeah, it's one of those. Um, I think Frank is is. Uh, more in line with Rob Myers' uh, position. Rob Myers is the senator from that district, and I think uh, Frank's more in line with Rob's uh, positions on things, and I and I think that's a strong race. And I wouldn't want to see that seat flip out, flip away from somebody who's fairly strong on fiscal policy uh, issues. So those are the six that that for me uh, are are most important coming out of the primary. There's a few I've got some questions on. I'm going to follow and see where this where the race goes. Jared uh, Gecker in uh, uh, Senate District L against uh, uh, against Kelly. Um, I he's got good positions. He certainly seems to be a stronger fiscal conservative than than uh, than the current senator is. Um, but I. <laughs> Uh, he he doesn't he doesn't come across strong on the PFD. It's more it's it's a bit of a wishy washy position on the PFD, and I and I don't want to go all out for you know somebody who's just going to get in there and 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 on that issue and other fiscal issues just sort of be wishy washy. Rob Yunt in uh, uh, Senate District N against uh, uh, against David. I I <laughs> at Valley uh, David is has um, been. Um, extremely wishy-washy on the on the PFD and on fiscal issues as a member of the Senate Finance Committee he's voted with the majority a lot of the times on on increased spending and on using the PFD to fund the increase the PFD cuts to fund the increased spending so I want to I want to lean toward Yunt but uh, and I want to help Yunt but I'm not quite convinced yet where he where he lands on those issues so I'm going to follow that more Mike Kronk um, uh, I, I will give credit to Kronk in his uh, in his written statements he Talked about a complete fiscal plan, uh, which I took as sort of a, a, a different way of saying the fiscal policy working group. Uh, that's going to be a, a, a tight race uh, there as well against uh, against Savannah. So I um, I, I want to favor Kronk, and, and I'm and I'm uh, strongly considering uh, Kronk, but haven't gotten over the line yet. And then there are two districts that I just don't know what the hell to do. One is HD 28, House District 28 in the Valley that Jesse Sumner represented. Uh, but Sumner stepping out of that race leaves it sort of a void. You know, you sort of wish if Sumner was going to do that, he would have done it before the before the, before the filing primary. date. Yeah. So you could have had somebody, somebody, you know, people consider running in that district that uh, that that would replace Jesse as opposed to you know waiting on him to to drop out after the after the uh, after the primary. Uh, it looks like Steve Menard, who carries the you know the Curtis Menard name um, uh, in that race, uh, is is a strong candidate, and and Lexi Moore uh, is a strong candidate. But it's it's hard to tell, you know, the difference between the two right now. Lexi Moore is one of those candidates who says I'm a strong defender of PFD, but no taxes. Well, that doesn't quite work. The deficits are too big to close by spending cuts alone. 
So if you're saying you're strong on the PFD, but no taxes, I'm not sure how you get to a, how you get to a strong PFD. Uh, if you're not, if you're not going to fund, if you're not going to use an alternative revenue to, to pay for the deficit. And then um, House District 36, uh, Kronk's old district. Right. Uh, Brandon Kowalski, a Democrat, uh, who nevertheless articulates very strong positions on the PFD and on fiscal policy. And Rebecca Schwanke, um, who uh, who finished uh, at the top on the on the R side. I'm going to follow that district also. But it's, it's I'm not I'm not sure what the what the how the positions are going to evolve as the campaign goes on. So those those are the top race. Those are the top races for me that I've that I've seen come out of the primary. You know, 30, uh, 34 or 36 uh, is uh, an interesting race. Uh, I don't know if you got a chance to watch the interviews with Cole Snodgrass in that race. Uh, one of the most impressive candidates, freshman or otherwise, that I've that I've had a chance to interview. Rebecca Schwanke also did very well, uh, in my opinion, during our interview. Uh, but Cole really, uh, really impressed me. Uh, but he also said that if he did not come in first on the Republican side, he would drop out. So uh, and, he, and, he, and he's already dropped out. I mean, I agree, dropped, uh, yeah, I agree with you. He, um, uh, he sort of like Agnes Moran. He was sort of a surprise in how strong he was on fiscal issues. Um, and I was I was pleased as I was reading through the summaries to see that um, I didn't really have a whole lot of interest in playing in that in that particular primary uh but i was looking at his results and i and i was hopeful that he would finish uh finish strong he did <laughs> but then he dropped out so yeah. it's hard but i mean i think he did the right thing i mean it you know because that's what he had committed to um and of course that's the problem in part with ranked choice voting is that you get these good candidates that continue to duke it out with each other versus uh, you know, having one solid candidate that you could at least get behind. So um, it's uh, it's a bit frustrating. Um, but, of uh, you know, those were the two candidates that I was hoping would uh, come out on top. Um, and uh, I, I will we'll see what happens there. But, yeah, definitely an interesting district to watch uh, as it uh, as it percolates along. So, so to speak. Kowalski strikes me just just reading and, and, and looking at the website and sort of listening to his stuff. Uh, it strikes me as a Bush Democrat. I mean, as literally, you know, somebody who who is is in the same camp as Neil Foster, and you know, talks a good game on fiscal policy, but you sort of wonder when the rubber meets the road and they start talking about, you know, cutting cutting the budget, and and the, and the Bush Caucus always is concerned that they're going to be the first to be cut. Uh, you know, whether you know he caves on fiscal issues as a as as a result of that, so. You know, it, it, as I say, he talks a good game um, uh, in the stuff that he's talked about and written and, 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 and articulated. Uh, but it's just there's just something there that uh, that that concerns me. What uh, what's your overall take on the primary? Is this give me a, a you know overall ranking as you look at the primary? What, what were your thoughts? Yeah, I yeah, that's a good question. Um, and and I, I guess I would summarize it by saying those who I who I think have very good fiscal positions, those who I would look to be leaders on that issue in the next uh, uh, in the next legislature um, and want to be leaders on that issue in the next legislature. Um, they, they are close. A lot of them are close, like Ben is close. Agnes is is right up there in, in, in that in House District one. Uh, uh, Sarah Vance certainly is 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 close. Uh, but they're not there yet. Um, and so I think it's going to take, I think it's going to take support for those candidates who, who, you know, I want to see as, as leaders on fiscal issues in the next session. I think it's going to take support to get them, to get them over the line. There's, there's none uh, that I would say just, you know, you know, pushed away the opposition and it's over and you don't, don't need to worry about it. Um, so it's, um, I, I think the primary, I mean, the primary is, is not the, certainly is not the, is not a huge indicator of the general because well, yeah, you know, look at the low and, yeah, the participation rate was the lowest in I mean years at this point. You know, just barely over fifteen percent. So yeah, I don't think that you're going to see. Uh, I think you'll see a lot different, especially with the presidential bump and everything else. I think it's going to be a whole different game in November. Yeah, but you got to. But but I mean, one of the things I did look at is are they close? 
I mean, you had you had candidates who had good positions running against incumbents, but the incumbents got more than 55 percent or 60 percent. So you really got to wonder whether right. they're close enough to be able to, to be able to, to get over to that. Get overcome. Yeah, to overcome. Like I said, it's a straw poll essentially at this point. So it'll be interesting to see where things uh, lay out especially in comparatives. We'll have a field day with the uh, primary to general comparatives when it's all said and done. The Michael Duke Show. Seriously humorous with a pinch of intellect. <laughs> pinch of intellect. Sorry. That is humorous. Here's Michael Dukes. Man, <clears throat> that guy's as mean as Brad is. All right. Uh, we got to uh, continue <laughs> continue on the weekly top three. Brad Keith Lee, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Number two. Number two. We're going to talk about Permanent fund reform. Uh, this is uh, th- this is an issue. We asked the question yesterday of uh, of uh, Jesse Keel. He's all in. I mean, you could just you could almost see him slathering to d- just you know um, all in on that. Uh, there was some interesting conundrums there as well. We could probably get into that later. But Brad, let's talk about permanent fund reform. Well, this is the issue. This is the issue we talked about last week. We talked about it the week before and and sort of like K through 12. Right. It's going to be it's going to continue popping up uh, because there are some who are hell bent on uh, on on making permanent fund uh, permanent fund re- reforms to the permanent fund. And and I I certainly believe that we need some reforms to the permanent fund, particularly the permanent fund board. Uh, we've talked a lot about on the show, a lot on the show previously on previous episodes, previous segments about about the problems, the concerns I have with the way the board is acting and the and the results under the board that we've got that now we've got on the board a bunch of personalities, some of whom are running for governor, some of whom want to you know make their reputation by you know demonstrating that they're really in control, um, and and they're causing the permanent fund permanent fund to sort of spin out of control. Um, and 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 not perform in the way that that it that it did under prior uh, uh, board members who wore gray suits and white shirts and just kept their kept their focus on on producing solid returns. So I so I'm a big believer that we need reforms to the permanent fund board uh, in terms of restructuring it to to require those on the those appointed to the board to have as they do in Texas, as the statu- Texas statutes require, have substantial expertise and, and, and knowledge and business and background, uh, knowledge and background in the in in the investment industry, a criteria that many of our current board members don't don't satisfy. And 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 making that an explicit requirement uh, to to being appointed to the permanent fund board. And then to increase the vetting on these members and to and to focus on uh, to, to make sure that they meet that criteria, require require that the permanent fund board appointees by the governor be subject to legislative confirmation, so that we can have a public vetting uh, of those of those members and not just have the governor slide in, as appears to be somewhat the case, have the governor slide in uh, uh, political supporters and, and politicos that uh, that that want to serve on the permanent fund board for to up their profile. Uh, to to require that legislative confirmation to make sure that they meet the criteria of substantial knowledge and expertise in the uh, in the in, in the investment industry, so I so I think there's there's a compelling case, an important case, for having reform to the the permanent bu- permanent fund uh, board and the membership and the structure of the permanent fund board. What I what I don't believe is that we need reform or restructuring. To, to how the permanent fund operates, per, particularly in with respect to the to the two fund uh, aspect of the uh, of the permanent fund uh, that right. we currently have the corpus the protections, right? The protections right. of the corpus versus the earnings reserve, right? And and th- those issues are sort of getting conflated. The reform necessary to the permanent fund board is sort of getting conflated with the reform some talk about to the permanent fund corporation. Cliff Grow had a piece, had an op ed piece. In uh, in the ADN uh, this past week that that said we need reform to the permanent fund we, we need reform to the permanent fund and sort of went through reforms both to the permanent fund board and to and to this proposal to merge the two accounts uh, together and I and I it's important 
I think it's important to keep those two issues separate. The reforms that we need to the permanent fund board separate from the reforms some are advocating reform, some are advocating to the to the to the account accounting system or the structure uh, of the permanent fund uh, permanent fund corporation. I was intrigued by Jesse Keel's uh, defense yesterday. Jesse Keel is one of those Senator Jesse Keel is one of those who advocates restructuring the permanent fund corporation to eliminate the two two fund account and uh, and merge them into a into a single account. I was intrigued by by Jesse's argument yesterday that you know there there are reasons why uh, we need to to merge the two accounts together uh, and and the protection that we will have is we will set a cap. Uh, on 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 what can be taken from the permanent fund corporation from the corpus at any point in time uh, as part of these reforms and that's the protection so we get the benefits in his view we get the benefits of merging the two accounts together what he thinks are the benefits and then right. we get the protection of the cap well we we've got a cap now the cap is in the form of the permanent fund earnings you can't take more from the permanent fund than is what in the is what in the is in the earnings reserve account and that acts as a cap on what you can take from the permanent fund as a whole. So it's not like we don't have a cap now. We have a cap. And the problem with the cap they want to use, the problem with the cap that those who want to merge the two accounts you want to use is, is the, the draw rate. They say, oh, well, we'll just you know have a 5% draw rate or we'll have some percent draw rate. That'll be our cap. And we can't take more than that. Well, this state has experience with caps. I mean, we have a spending cap in the Constitution that that is just way the hell out out there. You know, would allow earnings or would allow spending even more than 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 we've got currently. Caps that may seem fine at a moment don't necessarily remain fine. Don't necessarily remain useful caps uh, over the long term. The cap. Cliff talked about in his piece, the, clap, the cap, I think, that Jesse talked about yesterday is a 5% cap. Well, what if returns, as they have been the last several years, what if returns that the permanent fund uh, generates are less than 5%, 4%, 3%? Um, what, if the, what if the financial world restructures itself in a way that 3% becomes the new normal or 3.5% becomes the new normal or 4%? If we've got a cap set at 5%, all that we're doing is eating into the corpus. The difference between what the permanent fund earns and what the cap would be, if we spent up to the cap, we would be taking money out of the corpus. That's what that's that's the principal result of merging the two accounts together. Um, and so this this cap they talk about as being a protection may very well not turn out to be a protection. If right, I mean the reason they're talking about it now is because the permanent fund hasn't earned five percent over the last several years plus the $8 billion drain that the legislature did out of the earnings reserve, combined those two are, are making the earnings reserve look a lot skinnier than it used to when that $8 billion was still in it. So they're, they're talking about a cap that even now wouldn't protect raids against the corpus. Uh, it would it would allow, you know, it would limit the raid against the corpus, maybe, if it was a hard 5% cap but it still wouldn't protect the corpus. So I don't, I don't see a need to change the cap, to change the structure that we've got now. It's a pretty good structure. The reason, right. the reason that we've got a problem with the earnings reserve right now is because of the $8 billion that got taken out of it to push over in the corpus. We don't have a problem if we use that $8 billion as it was intended as a pre prepayment uh, for uh, for permanent fund inflation proofing, so well, I, I think I think we're fine where we are. And I think the part of the problem here is that this is a little bit of a smoke and mirrors red herring because understanding that any because he talked about a constitutional cap on the draw amount, um, and the problem that most people don't understand is that any constitutional amendment requires a separate bill and a separate vote. So by separating the two things out, the com the combining of the two funds and the cap, there's always a potential that the cap portion of it doesn't pass muster either with the legislature because you have to have a supermajority to get it onto the ballot as a constitutional amendment or the people 
don't vote it in, which I think is less likely, but I think it's more likely it wouldn't make it past the floor, but they could have both pieces together and say, oh, well, we need this and this, and then just get access to the corpus and not have it. And ironically, not 10 minutes before the question that I asked him yesterday about this, he said he doesn't believe in spending caps because you shouldn't encumber one over to the other, but then he's supporting a spending cap in the form of a draw uh, a cap on the other side. So it's a little bit uh, it's a little bit disingenuous in that regard. Yeah, and and I might I might listen to those arguments more if we didn't already have a cap. I mean, what the earnings set aside the 8 billion dollars that they drained out of the earnings reserve um as arguably as or allegedly as prepayments for uh, for permanent fund inflation proofing. Set aside that. What the earnings reserve does is really capture what the what the what the permanent fund is earning at any given point in time, the actual returns that the permanent fund is earning at any given point in time. So it operates as a cap that not perfectly, but 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 better than just this artificial number we would pick out of the air, uh, acts as a cap to, to cap the draws from the permanent fund to the amount of the earnings that the permanent fund um, is generating. And I think that's a much better cap, a, a cap that tracks the actual earnings from the permanent fund as opposed to an artificial cap with the number plucked out of the air. I think that's a much better cap uh, going forward uh, than, uh, than, than the alternative that, uh, that those who want to merge the accounts uh, together argue for. So, so it's, it's, it, I, I just, I, I, we need to distinguish when people say, yeah, we need to change the permanent fund. There's two issues in there. One, do we need to change the permanent fund board? Right. And I think that the answer to that's a strong yes. Right. The second is, do we need to say, change the structure of the permanent fund? I think the answer to that's a strong no. Right. I agree. Um, Kyle Johansson says some in the legislature will try and combine the account merge bill and the board restructuring bill. These must stay separate and pass or fail on their own merit. And I agree because it's definitely a yes on one and no on the other. And they have to be uh, they have to be a separate vote because while they focus on the same issue, they are completely different critters as far as that goes. Um, all Quick what, fi final thought, Brad. We're done. Well, and, and I'm just saying that's that's my problem with Cliff Grow's uh, op-ed. Cliff Cliff does combine those two. He sort of treats them the same. That we need to we need to reform the permanent fund, and these are the issues we need to address. There are separate issues in there, and we need to keep them in our minds separate because I think they have separate answers. Yeah, I would agree. Not to mention, of course, all the. Uh, shell gaming gimmickry that they did to show how low the earnings reserve account is i mean it's just it's it's astonishing to look at you know this is the same thing i remember walker doing the same thing on the permanent fund you know oh look at how much little money there is in here and blah 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 and of course never counting the income that was going to be coming into the account only what was there and the draws that were happening it was the draws for the next two years but no deposits for the next two years and it was doom and gloom uh, which again was his justification for cutting the PFD all over again. It's, it's, oh man, it's crazy. Absolutely crazy. Brad? Well, no, it, uh, we do have, and that's part of the, that's probably the problem with the permanent fund board. I mean, the permanent fund board is, is an advocate for this, for, for combining the two accounts. Um, and, and they, and in, in, in support of that advocacy, of combining the two accounts, they are doing the accounting system for the for the earnings reserve in a way that shows it in its worst possible light. I mean, the legislature, the the first the, the eight billion dollars that got pulled out of the permanent fund earnings reserve by the legislature and put into the permanent fund corpus, the first four billion dollars was explicitly for inflation proofing. Uh, the 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 Legislative language, the legislative intent language that accompanied that was explicit for infl inflation proofing. It comes over to the permanent fund, and the permanent fund immediately recognizes it as as in in the first accounting that it did after that money came over. They recognized it as as there for inflation proofing. They dropped a footnote. They they took out projected inflation proofing for the requisite number of years. Um, and said, yes, that, that accounts for inflation proofing. Well, after about a year and a half, all of a sudden that disappears. It was, it was like, it was like, you know, the, 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 the same treatment that got hand, that, that, that the dividend got treated with by, by ledge finance 
they recognize it as DGF, they recognize the dividend as, as, as designated general funds. And then in, in 2017, all of a sudden they started seeing it, saying it was un, undesignated or unrestricted general funds. And so it was, you, you could spend it on anything. It's this, it's the same sort of sleight of hand. And it was the permanent fund board, the permanent fund corporation that dropped that footnote, changed the accounting treatment of the first $4 billion. Second $4 billion came, comes in also for inflation proofing because the first $4 billion, the governor had, had the legislature had appropriated like nine and a half billion dollars. The governor had line itemed it down to $4 billion. So the legislature went back and refilled what it originally intended, put another $4 billion toward that, toward that purpose. That comes in and the, and the permanent fund corporation doesn't ever treat it as, as prepaid. It's just their money. You know, thank you very much. It's not right, prepaid, right. It's not prepaid or anything. So the permanent fund board has been part of these games, these accounting games that have created this so-called emergency in the in the earnings reserve, and they have a bias in it because they're advocating the merger of the two counts together. It's right. we, we need to go back. I mean, one of one of the things I like about Agnes Moran, to tell you the honest truth, in House District One, she's the sister of Bill Moran. Who was the who was a chairman of the of the permanent fund corporation board uh, at one point and is and is the guy that I have in my in vision when I talk about gray suits and white shirts. Bill Moran was the was the president of First Bank down in Ketchikan, um, and 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 sort of the 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 typical gray gray suit white shirt guy, very staid, very conservative, great banker, uh, uh, very focused on on returns on investment. Um, that's, that's who we need to go back to. Right. Uh, and that's the kind of permanent fund board, board structure that we need to have and stop all this games playing that's going on at the permanent fund board level. David asked, we got about 90 seconds here. David asked, Mike, ask the Brad about the other category of funds. I guess the category that is other, I'm not sure what David's asking there. Maybe do you, are you well, when you look at when you look at the maybe he's talking about this the budget. Uh, when you look at the at the at the annual budget, the operating budget, you've got unrestricted general funds, you got designated general funds, you've got other, and then you've got federal funds. And yes, there is a category of other uh, in there. And the permanent fund dividend got moved into that category from time to time in the past. Um, it's, a, it's a category of funds. It's not very big. Right. Well, I mean, that was probably during the shell transfer days when it was a simple, just a simple transfer and it was not really counted one way or the other, which again, um, curses to Walker and company and parts of the permanent fund for changing how they accounted for it. That opened up the floodgates for what we have today. Um, and unfortunately, it's now become the political football that it is uh, right now. All right. Uh, Brad. And, we got, and, and we've got the people who are supposed to be the referees, the permanent fund board, playing in the game on one side. Yeah, exactly. It's like, what's that game? It's almost like a racquetball, right? You just keep bouncing the ball back to yourself more than anything else. You're playing a solo game of racquetball. Brad, uh, we're on to number three, oil and gas and misinformation. Um, that word gets thrown around a lot. So what do you mean exactly? What are you talking about? I've noticed uh, letters to the editor popping up in uh, in several of the state's newspapers um, from uh, Joe Shearhorn, who uh, uh, used to head Northrum Bank, maybe still does head Northrum Bank, and Jim Jansen, two of the two of the top five percent, top one percent in the state, who uh, who often uh, you know argue in favor of permanent fund dividend cuts as a, as a way of balancing the budget aren't big on talking about spending cuts, but they're big on talking about permanent fund dividend cuts as a way of, of, uh, of funding that spending. They're also big defenders of the oil industry. Um, and, and these, these letters to the editor uh, that are popping up are, are interesting. Here's, here's what it says. There's a resurgence in oil project production and jobs in Alaska that is directly related to our current, current oil tax policy, SB 21, a fair and competitive tax policy replaced the antiquated ACES tax structure that drove down petroleum investment for more than a decade. ACES wasn't in effect, in effect for a decade. So you sort of wonder about that. But thanks to SB 21, Alaskans have the greatest opportunity of our generation on the North Slope today. Some present and former legislators argue that SB 21 was a mistake, but the facts speak for themselves. 
So what they're into, what these letters are anticipating, and there'll and there'll be an op-ed that will come from them at some point because it has in the past. What these letters are anticipating is is as we get into the fall, as we get into the legislative races, as people get pressed on how you're going to pay for the spending that you're advocating, that a number of, of legislators, uh, candidates, and a n- number of legislators will weigh in and talk about oil tax reform as being as being part of the package uh, to, uh, to to pay for the deficits that that uh, that we're generating. And they and these guys are trying to get out in front and say, don't change don't change SB 21. What they what what the next paragraph would say if they wrote it is use permanent fund dividend cuts instead. Don't change don't t- change SB twenty one. Here, here's here's my problem with this letter. It's misleading uh, in in this sense. It's it's saying that SB twenty one has led to uh, new investment, has led to jobs, has led to production growth. What they leave out is its impact on state revenues. And as we've talked about on through uh, on previous segments of the show, what's going on with SB 21, the longer it stays in effect as it was originally passed, looking forward, what SB 21 is doing is growing production volumes. I have no argument with that. It's growing the jobs related to those production volumes, but state revenues from that increased production is staying flat the state is not getting the benefit in terms of additional revenues from from those additional volumes. And it's the way in which SB 21 is operating in sort of the environment that we've moved into 10 years years after its passage. They want to keep it the same because because they want to see that continued production increase and, and, and job growth, job growth related to the oil industry. But that's not the only way we ought to be evaluating whether SB 21 is working. We ought to be looking at it critically in terms of what's its impact on state revenues. Are state revenues growing with this, it, with that increase in production? Are Alaskans getting the benefit of that additional, uh, are Alaskans overall getting the benefit of that increased production from uh, uh, in terms of in terms of increased state revenues? And the answer, when you look at the Department of Revenue spring revenue forecast, when you look at the revenue forecast before that, the fall 2023 revenue forecast, the answer is no. The answer, in fact, is even though we're having a growth in production volumes, the two segments of oil taxes, the two pieces of the oil tax universe that that applies most to production, royalty and, uh, and, and production tax, are going down. Over that period of time, over the next ten years, are going over over the outlook period in the state revenue forecast are going down over that period. The only reason that 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 we're staying flat, the state revenues are staying flat, uh, is because of the growth in the petroleum corporate uh, corporate income tax. That's offsetting the decline in revenues coming from from oil to, from uh, production taxes and from uh, royalties. So it's. W- what they're doing, I mean, as any advocate would, I suppose, they're focusing on the positives that there is oil production growth, that we do have a growth in jobs in the segment of the Alaska universe that's focused on oil oil industry jobs, although a lot of those are coming from non, non-residents who are flying in to take those jobs. Uh, but we have, we have growth in those segments, but we're not getting the benefit to the state in terms of, in terms of revenue growth that's commensurate commensurate with the uh, with the production growth. So it's they're telling half a tale uh, and they're not they're not giving the full picture. They're trying to convince Alaskans that SB 21 is working for Alaskans, all Alaskans because of the production growth and the jobs. But they're not telling Alaskans as they should that 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 Alaskans are not getting the benefit of any revenue growth out of that out of that increased production. And that's and that's and that's what we're going to see. Right? That's what we're going to see in terms of in terms of, of this as debate as it goes on. It's going to be selective. Let, let me use selective numbers here. Let me use the production growth and the jobs growth, jobs recovery. Um, let me use those numbers and, and and let's forget about this revenue side. But the revenue side, I mean, what's what's most important to Alaskans out of the oil industry? It's the revenues. It's the state revenues, right? 
that's where Alaskans benefit from the oil industry. That's right. where Alaskans benefit. Well, that's where our constitutional mandate is, right? Maximum benefit of the state and the citizens. That's what it's supposed to be. I mean, you've advocated for it. You've said, look, we're not getting our fair share. Uh, SB 21 was <clears throat> better than the other in the short run, but in the long run, we're finding out that it's not giving us, again, increased production, flat or or lower revenues. We need to start looking at that and realize we have a finite resource and we should be getting what you know our fair share is out of a finite resource and stop essentially letting that money slip off the table. And you've estimated what, four or five hundred million dollar potentially on the table every year that we're letting go away that could again offset PFD cuts or others. It's not even my estimate. It, it's it's the Department of Revenue ran estimates back when Dunleavy was was focused on on fixing the budget crisis uh, other than through PFD cuts. Department of Revenue ran a number of alternatives of alternative revenue sources. One of those was looking at changes to the oil tax, oil taxes. And that $400 comes from the Dunleavy, from the Department of Revenue estimates of, of what you could generate out of, out of, uh, out of changing the oil tax in a struck in a way that wouldn't damage the competitiveness of Alaska for, for investment dollars um, uh, and would and would derive additional revenue uh, uh, for the state. So you got $400 there, $400 million there, and you got another $100 million from the from the Hill Corp loophole uh, in, uh, in the in the petroleum corporate income tax, um, I mean, we would have even even with the decline in in revenues coming from the production tax and from uh, royalties over the next ten years, we would have an increase if if Hill Corp a, a small increase, but we'd have an increase if Hill Corp paid corporate petroleum corporate income taxes, but they don't. Because of this, because of this loophole they've taken advantage of, um, and so so it's four hundred million dollars plus or minus Department of Revenue estimate from changes in the from changes that would not change the competitive structure, but changes in in the way SB twenty one operates, um, plus the hundred million dollars five hundred million dollars when you add in the hundred million dollars from the from closing the uh, Hill Corp loophole. I don't know if you got a chance to watch the whole interview. It was definitely an interesting interview yesterday uh, with Jesse Keel. Um, and he let, you know, he really let, let the fur fly as far as all the things that he wants and he wants it all, man. Combining the permanent fund doesn't think we're going to get, uh, much in the way of fiscal policy. He's okay with the 2575. Um, he wants to find benefits, uh, more education spend. I mean, it was a little bit of, uh, give me it all, give me it all at this point. I think I think it was a great interview, Michael. I think he did a good job, you know, getting getting his positions out there and raising the questions that need to be raised, and sort of, and in the process of doing that, highlighting the the internal inconsistencies um, uh, in the uh, in, in the argument. Uh, one of those one of those on the defined benefits I found interesting was uh, the talk about um, uh, turnover rate. Um, turnover rates the key variable, or one of the key variables. Uh, one of the important key variables in uh, uh, in in the defined benefits argument. If you assume that the turnover rate is is high uh, under the current plan and low under a under the defined contribution plan and low under the defined benefits plan, you get a bunch of savings from uh, from training and from and from bringing on new people that that you have if the turnover rate is high. So if you say that we've got a high turnover rate under the um, under the defined contribution plan and we'll have a low turnover under the defined benefit plan uh, then then you get uh, you get a, a big uh, a, a big boost out of that you in your argument you get a lot of dollars um, out of that but but he but his argument sort of was yes we have a very high rate under the uh, under the defined contribution plan and that's one of the reasons we need a defined benefit plan but if you assume the defined benefit benefit plan cures the turnover rate, uh, then the defined benefit plan becomes more expensive and much more expensive because you're paying in all these defined benefit. You're paying the government, state's paying in all these all these advanced payments to, for defined benefits uh, because you're assuming everybody's going to max out on defined benefits. And so he walked this very narrow tightrope of saying, yes, the turnover rate under defined contribution is high. 
the turnover rate under defined benefits will be will be lower, but it won't be so low as to make the defined benefit uh, plan uh, uh, more expensive. So it was it was it was it was a very it was a very narrow tightrope uh, with respect with respect to that issue on uh, defined benefits. I that's that's an issue we need to we need to focus on the turnover rate and get a, get an answer on the turnover rate. Uh, and there's not a good answer to that because we haven't done a whole lot of exit interviews as you as as Did came out during during your interview. My, my shock. We know the state doesn't do exit interviews. What people are voluntarily leaving? Wouldn't you like to know why they're leaving? Wouldn't you like to have an idea systemically with twenty thousand employees why somebody's leaving? You don't ask. Ah, oh, no, but the union does. I'm sure that'll be nonpartisan. And <laughs> you know, I'm like, what the what the what. Yeah, there was there was another piece of that that I found interesting. I mean, so one of the arguments for going to defined benefits is defined contributions are costing more, costing the contributors more, and paying them less. Um, I've lived under during my work career. I lived under both defined benefits and defined contribution plans, and I found that defined contribution plans were better. Uh, the reason they were better is because I could pick the the investment op, the investments I wanted to make out of the contribution, uh, my contribution and, and the matching contribution, I that that I could pick the investments investment I wanted to make out of that, and and the um, the people I work for, the law firms I work for, and the and the and the contribution plans they had set up, produced some pretty healthy returns, better than than are are being produced, but better than were produced by the defined benefit plans that I had for a portion of my career. So I, 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 and others, I know others benefited from having defined contributions as Jesse was describing. And as I recall this discussion during the defined benefit plan, I mean, a lot of it is hinging on the fact that we have essentially trash defined contribution alternatives for, uh, or plans for, for people who are making defined contributions. And I and and part of the answer may be in looking at what plans we're offering for the defined contribution people, and and seeing if we can't improve those plans. If we're just giving them the opportunity of plans that are that that have high front end costs or have high management fees and have low returns, then yeah, I can see why you're upset with that. But if they have the opportunity of plans that have fairly moderate management, as as I had the advantage of, fairly moderate management fees. And fairly high returns if you play them right, uh, then I think that defined contribution is better. Um, and we may, and the state may not be offering the type of the type of variety of defined contribution plans that they, that that uh, enable you to uh, to put that uh, put that together. Well, that was one of the recommendations from Reason was that we look at the defined contributions and improve that because they did say there could be improvements on that to make it more competitive with other areas. But they don't want to hear it. What they want to hear is they want to hear a return to defined benefits because that's what that's what the unions want. And that's uh, that's the direction that they uh, that they yeah. want to push it. Unfortunately, can we afford it and who pays? That's the that's the biggest question there. And there's really no answer to that other than the permanent fund and the people of the state of Alaska. That's it. All yeah, there, right. There was one last thing that I'll do quickly. Jesse said uh, also that, that, you know, we have that people who are in this new defined benefit plan will have skin in the game. If it blows up, they'll pay part of the cost. We yeah. had a pension plan blow up before. And what happened then was the state said, state rushed in and said, Oh, we'll take care of it. We'll, yeah. We'll take care of those costs. So I don't and have it, any faith that if it blows up. And all up, the municipalities and everything else. Yeah. All right. Final thoughts today, Brad, as we wrap things up for this morning, your final thoughts. Uh, so I think, I think the, uh, I think the primary has indicated that we've got a path forward on a, on a realistic fiscal plan, uh, people who are advocates of realistic fiscal plans, but we're, but they're all most, well, all of them are in tight races. Most of them are in tight races, I guess. Uh, and, and we're going to need to be supportive of the candidates who are, who are focused on fiscal issues, focused on advocating the right position on fiscal issues, we're going to need to be supportive of them uh, to get them over the line. That's going to be that's going to be sort of the fall push um, uh, as uh, as we head toward the general election. Brad Keithley, Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets, the weekly top three. I'll have some thoughts on this in the other side. We'll be talking to Brad here at the top of the hour uh, with some final thoughts, maybe on yesterday's conversation with Jesse and more. 
Uh, you could find him at ak4sb.com uh, or just go argue with him over on Twitter. He loves that. He just lives for the Twitter fights, uh, the X fights out there now, I guess. X battles, whatever they're calling them these days. Brad, thank you so much for coming on board and joining us. We appreciate it. Michael, as always, thanks for having me. Well, that's a wrap for another week's edition of the weekly top three from Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. Thank you again for joining us. Remember that you can find past episodes on our YouTube, SoundCloud, Spotify, and Substack pages. And keep track of us during the week on Facebook and Twitter. This has been Brad Keithley, Managing Director of Alaskans for Sustainable Budgets. We look forward to you joining us again next week on the Weekly Top 3.